Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to see everybody's here. I'm Steve Cheney. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the American Security Project. And what is probably a first for ASP is starting an event early. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but I'm, we're just delighted to have such a crowd uh, and covering this specific topic. Uh, to give you a little bit of history, ASP was really not that involved with the Cuba program until a very specific date. It was November 18th, 2014. And I was tooling down Route 95 going to Quantico when I got a phone call said, get back to your office because there was about to be a national press conference held in it. I said, about what? He said, Alan Gross has just come back from Cuba with Scott Gilbert, who is his pro bono lawyer. Scott's on our board. They're going to do their press conference in our boardroom. Uh, and thereupon, I got to meet Scott. I got to meet Alan. And there started our Cuba program. Uh, and it expanded greatly following that, uh, so much so that we went down to Cuba several times. Uh, the first time we went down, we spent a week there, a group contingent from ASP, and met Ambassador De Laurentiis, uh, spent a great deal of time with the government down there. And the take from ASP is that we're a very pro-trade organization. Now, we're concerned about national security, but the military folks that are on our board, and we've got eight retired three- and four-star generals and admirals, far more would see diplomacy and trade than they'd see military conflict. And that was kind of a premise for us going down there, was hopefully lifting the embargo and getting more trade with Cuba and having better military-to-military -military relations. Um, things have taken a bit of a turn here in the last couple of years. Uh, as I'm sure many of our panelists will talk about today. Uh, we are just delighted to have such a distinguished panel, and, and the book, I think, is going to be fabulous. Uh, you all need to get a copy of it and read it. Um, so I won't belabor the point here other than to say that our intense interest still remains with Cuba. Uh, we still remain that we would love to see the embargo lifted. We think our diplomatic relations ought to be improved. Uh, that we can do a lot more than we're currently doing, and I'll kind of leave it at that and let the, let the panel handle the rest of it. Uh, with that, we have a most distinguished speaker going to start, Ambassador De Laurentiis. Uh, he's an old hand on Latin America. He's certainly well familiar with Cuba, having been down there for many, many years. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ambassador De Laurentiis. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, very much, General Cheney, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to the American Security Project for hosting today's uh, launch. Uh, I'm also grateful to Professor uh, Whitmer for involving me in this project. So let me start with a stark and fairly obvious comment. Um, relations between the United States and Cuba are not good, uh, and unlikely unlikely to improve in the short term. Uh, we've all watched the reversals since January 2017 and heard and read the justifications. Uh, official government to government communication is, from what I understand, at minimal levels. Uh, even on migration and law enforcement matters where cooperation had been longstanding and mutually beneficial. Some of the United States like uh, where we are. Uh, some in Cuba do as well, I suspect. Many more in both countries, I believe, uh, do not. So let's set the stage. Uh, when talking about U.S.-Cuban relations, uh, first we have to start with the premise that the issue generates very strong views among stakeholders and interested constituencies. It's personal for many on both sides of the Florida Straits. How could it not be? It is a foreign and domestic policy issue, I would argue, in both countries. There are still strong supporters of the normalization process of commercial and other forms of engagement here and there, <clears throat> just as the, there are those who opposed it then and now, here and there. Second, uh, reasonable people disagree on what the U.S. relationship with Cuba should be and have been disagreeing for over 60 years. That said, I'll, I'll take a leap and, and say that Cuban watchers in the United States anyway can probably agree on some fundamental policy goals. We want to advance and protect U.S. national interests, geopolitical, security, commercial, uh, including protecting U.S. territory and citizens. We want to promote American, better said, universal values, including the promotion and protection of human rights. We want to encourage reform in Cuba, and we want to help the Cuban people. 
The divergence comes uh, in how we achieve these goals. When I arrived in Cuba in 1991 for the first of my three postings, I was convinced that isolation and pressure would eventually yield results. When I departed two years later, I had come to the conclusion that our policy was not working and was hurting the Cuban people more than the intended targets. And I believe that 70% of the American public has reached the same conclusion today. Even though you could strongly disagree about many things, including how we organize our respective societies and the values we champion, you should still be able to have a civil conversation, find common ground when it's in your interest to do so, and influence your interlocutor along the way. We had achieved this modus operandi with many countries around the world with systems similar to Cuba's. Why could we not do it with a country 90 miles off our shore? I don't want to repeat um, what I've written in the, in the foreword of the, of the book we're launching, but you know, let me offer a, a quick review. Um, President Obama came into office promising to re-examine our Cuba policy because the one in place had failed to achieve its objectives. His view was that we couldn't continue doing the same thing and expect a different result. And so to draw a bit from his words on December 17th, 2014, when he announced the policy change, he said that, quote, our governments had settled into a seamlessly end endless confrontation in a world that had remade itself time and time again, we are still fighting, close quote. So could this be changed on terms acceptable to both? Well, yes, and I believe we demonstrated that. Ultimately, to me, as a diplomat or as a former diplomat, this is a story about the practice of diplomacy, its transformative potential, its high impact, and its power, and how it affected people's lives on both sides of the Florida Straits. Real conversations were begun between governments estranged for decades. Reconciliation between people on opposite sides of an ideological divide was no longer unthinkable. So let's remind ourselves what were the ingredients that led the secret negotiations begun in September 2013 to succeed. And I would argue this is, of course, an American perspective. First is leadership and political will. Uh, President Obama wanted this to happen. He believed our 50-year-old policy was a relic of the Cold War, getting in the way of our agenda in Latin America. He believed that Cuba was changing and that engagement, our engagement, would have greater impact as Cuba determined its future. Second was perseverance. These secret talks, and frankly, the talks that followed the secret talks, uh, were very difficult, uh, and, and they dragged on for months. Trust was difficult to build. Cuban suspicions of American intentions uh, were almost overwhelming. During this period, it was really at Mandela's funeral where that began to change. That was in December of 2013. So that brings, brings me to the next, which is mutual respect. And this brief exchange between the two presidents, Presidents Obama and Castro, at the funeral helped solidify an atmosphere of respect. And the tenor of the negotiations changed after that. And the fourth and final thing was third party engagement at the right time, and that was the Vatican. Both sides had committed to a lot, had made concessions, uh, and they needed a third party to validate the agreement uh, and reassure each side that the other would meet their commitments. And the Vatican played a role in that. And those negotiations concluded in November of 2014. Well, we all know what happened next. The simultaneous announcements by Obama and Castro on December 17th, 2014, and what continued to happen over the next two years. And frankly, it's hard to discuss any of it without touching on the emotional and human component of what was a diplomatic and historic sea change. And I was very fortunate to be in Havana during this extraordinary period in the bilateral relationship because I saw what was possible. So while the prognosis in the short term is negative, let me conclude by telling you what a productive, impactful relationship looks like. Between early 2015 and January 2017, the two governments were in perpetual contact. We reestablished diplomatic relations, we opened embassies, we signed 22 agreements beneficial to both countries, and began 17 dialogues on issues two, two countries 90 miles apart ought to have as a matter of course, including on tough subjects like human rights and expropriated properties. 
People-to-people -people travel was skyrocketing with hundreds of thousands of Americans visiting. Business delegations poured in, leading to increased commerce. Uh, as we know, there are still something like 60 U.S. businesses engaged in lawful commercial transactions uh, uh, with Cuban entities. Cultural and educational leaders also came and organized exchanges. The U.S. residence where I lived was a revolving door with thousands of Americans and increasing numbers of Cubans from all walks of life passing through. Regulatory changes, among other things, enabled increased telecommunication connections between the two countries. Cell phones were working, Wi-Fi hotspots were sprouting up all over the country. Uh, Cubans were coming online. Uh, and now recently, that's developed into a mobile um, internet, uh, which I believe was launched last December. The private sector, which is real, despite official uh, US government statements to the contrary, was dynamic and growing. Unfortunately, it's facing significant challenges now. Living conditions for the Cuban people were improving, not for everyone, but it was a start. People's mentalities were changing. Younger Cubans were enthusiastic about the future, putting their energy into new commercial and other ventures rather than plotting to leave. A statement several months back by a senior uh, administration official that nothing has changed on the ground in 20 years is just false. I know I was there. Was the process going to be linear? Could the dynamic between the two countries change overnight? No, not a chance. There was still plenty of history and ideology, ideology to work through, but the trajectory was where it should be. I would concede now perhaps that we probably did not go far enough. Both sides could have done more to ensure the sustainability and irreversibility of the new relationship. And so I try to look at this as a process. With fits and starts, we've taken a detour and the detour will either be a long and winding one uh, or relatively short. But I remain very proud to have been a part of the normalization process of what we accomplished. I continue to believe that the engagement we began, what we did, was and is the best way to advance American interests, to have an impact on the ground, and to promote the universal values we hold dear. For me now, as a former diplomat, Cuba is about unfinished business about an opportunity I hope in the long run will not be squandered to resolve long-standing painful disputes between two neighbors who have failed still to find a way to get along. My advice, we need to get back to the negotiating table as quickly as possible. And I hope that the critical thinking offered by the, the Cuba-US bilateral relationship, new pathways and policy choices will help move that process along. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask our panel to come on up, take your seats, and we're going to uh, discuss. We're, we're very lucky today to have a distinguished panel, all editors and authors of the, this new book, literally on the presses today, they tell me. Uh, that's why there's no copies of the book. But there, <laughs> but there is, at the back, you'll see a flyer. So pick that up. That'll get you a 30% discount on ordering the book. Again. Cuba-U.S. Bilateral Relationship, New Pathways and Policy Choices. Um, I'm Andrew Holland, Chief Operating Officer of the American Security Project. Uh, and I think I'll just go straight into this, this panel and, and straight into discussion. I'm going to introduce our, uh, our speakers, and then uh, we'll start a discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll talk some up here, and then we're going to open it out to, to questions from the audience. Uh, it, this is a... Uh, interesting topic, a hot topic, and uh, thank you all for coming at the end of, at the end of August here. Frankly, I, I didn't think that we'd get uh, a full house uh, two days before the Labor Day weekend. So, so thank you all for coming, and thanks for your interest in this important topic. Uh, we do have a distinguished panel today, uh, all of them in town from Nebraska. As a, a former staffer for uh, Nebraska senator, it's, it's good to have that, that connection. <laughs> uh, they're in town for the American Political Science Association's annual meeting. Uh, as I said, all authors uh, or editors of, of this book. Uh, Professor Mike Kelly, here to my right, coordinates the International and Comparative Law Program at Creighton University School of Law. He's been on the front lines of Cuba policy as an expert on the international law of expropriations, key unresolved issue here. 
uh, and he's, he's written long and deep on this issue. Uh, Dr. Erica Moreno, at the end, is the chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Creighton University. Her work has addressed the stability of regimes, democracy and autocracy, political transitions, and the role of regime characteristics on economic outcomes. Uh, Dr. Rick, Rick Whitmer, uh, in the middle here, is a distinguished professor of government and politics at Creighton. Uh, he has specialized on Congress, interest groups, voting elections, and, and U.S.-Cuban relations. Uh, finally, Jonathan, Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado uh, is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the University of Nebraska o Omaha. Uh, he's the author of Power of the People, Energy in the Cuban Nuclear Program, uh, and, Cuba's en and the editor of Cuba's Energy Future, published by the Brookings Institution Press. Like I said, we're lucky to have them all here, and uh, I'm going to go right into the, the questions here. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Mike. Sure. Uh, you've been working on this issue for a long time, but what's the genesis of the book? Why do you think it's important now? Uh, what's the background on, on, on your, your work here? Well, uh, we developed an expertise at, at Creighton and in Omaha on mm -hmm. Cuba in 2005 and seven when we published a, a book on resolving the outstanding property claims mm -hmm. from the 1959 uh, takeover of the Castro uh, dictatorship. Um, and we had been uh, looking at ways to expand on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we also uh, did some research in Spain uh, about cr property claims, also from huh. that same era. Um, and then with the, with the opening uh, of Cuba in 2014 by the Obama administration, suddenly, there was a, a buffet of opportunities to look at with respect to policy choices. And the policy choices were ones that needed to be made both in D.C. and Havana discreetly, but by D.C. and Havana jointly in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, just like Ambassador De Laurentiis uh, noted, there's a domestic aspect to this as well as an international and bilateral aspect. Um, and so in talking to uh, my editors at Oxford University Press, uh, it, the notion came around, well, you know, let's go ahead and, and do this now. Let's, let's survey what these policy options are and put it into a book and try to get these talking points out into the next presidential election cycle, mm -hmm. uh, which of course would be the, the, the one coming up. Right, um, and uh, and all of these all of these policy choices on the legal front, um, the economics front, the political front, uh, the diplomacy front, um, are ones I think that are going to help shape the framework of what our bilateral relationship looks like. Uh, a lot of people have said that uh, when the Trump administration took over, they took what was sort of a you know a thawing tropical relationship mm -hmm. and put it in the freezer for a time. Someone's going to come along and take it out of the freezer. Uh, and we need to figure out uh, which pathways are going to be the best for both countries. Because all of us believe, uh, I think, that the destinies of our two countries are to come together. Yeah. The question is, how does that happen? Take it out of the freezer. I like that, that term. Um, I'm going to toss a question here to Jonathan. Uh, you know, A critical part of the relationship, uh, understanding by both sides on what's actually happening on the ground. You know, breaking through the stories each side tells, the ideolo ideology. And so the reason I'm asking you, you were recently in Cuba. What did you say, your, your 38th trip? Mm -hmm. uh, what should Americans know that's not in the headlines? What, what should folks in D.C. know uh, in Havana and the, and, the, and the island overall that, that's not, that we're not hearing? Well, I'm going to echo the ambassador's comments as to the fact that there has been transformation and that you started going there in the early 90s, because that's when I started going there. And it, with every visit, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time walking around and observing and... And the thing that I, I, I will echo is he was very precise in how he, he presented what has actually occurred. The fact is, is that this new generation of leadership in Cuba has, you know, going to have their hands on the tiller as, as, they, as they try to kind of navigate a path forward. And they're going to bring with them a, a collective understanding of where they have been. But I think what, we're, what they're settling through right now is how they're going to chart that course forward. And so part of what I, what I would like people to know and to understand is that it's not been static. 
it's an actually a very dynamic process. Um, that you know, there are more and more students who are having the opportunity to go outside of the country to work and to study, and then they return, and they're not being penalized for doing that. And so I think it brings a an invigorated uh, type of thinking about what the future of Cuba might be. But I can think to echo Professor Kelly as well. This has to happen in concert with with the United States, but it has to be done on the terms that the Cuban state set forth. That's where all the hard work is going to have to take place. I think that you know, uh, my contribution to the book was looking at how we would dismantle uh, the, the Cuban Libertad Act, the Helms Burton, yeah. and all of the travails that that entails, because it's very, 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 it, the, the barriers are very, very high. Right. Um, and I think that it really is going to involve an iterative process of where we build trust and confidence in one another in order to be able to move this entire enterprise forward. But, I'm very optimistic from what I have seen on the ground in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, little by little, you know, um, I was there in, at, in the midst of the, of, of the special period, and it's an entirely different world you know, than it was then. You know, literally, a city of two million people with no electricity. Um, it's something I'd never seen before, and it was really hard to experience, yeah. and yet I fully understand now that, that while they've made significant gains, there's so much work that remains. Thank you. Uh, Erica, you know, I think it's, it's appropriate here in Washington that we're talking about state-to-state -state interactions. We're talking about, you know, the, the government-to-government interaction. But of course, of course, diplomacy is more than just that. Um, what do you think uh, are other avenues for diplomacy or, at the bare minimum, communication between the two countries? And, and what might those avenues produce? Yeah, as, as a political scientist, obviously my tendency also is to look immediately at, at state actors and how they interact with each other, what the official statements are. But we do know that diplomacy comes in many different forms, and that is sort of the typical track one diplomacy, which is state to state, uh, representatives talking, negotiating. Uh, but of course there are other levels of diplomacy as well, and that's part of the reason why we broke up the book the way we did. Um, is dealing with the political side, so dealing with political actors, state leaders, but also dealing with the um, grassroots activities, right, which were ushered in by some of those changes that Ambassador De Laurentiis talked about. So the fact that citizens can communicate with one another, that they can travel back and forth, uh, and if you ever are fortunate enough to spend some time in Cuba, you see uh, this interaction taking place on a regular basis. U.S. citizens, Cuban citizens, just mingling with each other, engaging in all kinds of activities. And that's a powerful thing, too. Um, so that, that has a potential for long-term change, even if it is slow. We might not see the immediate effects. Um, but then we also looked at, uh, so the political dimension is one, but the economic dimension is another. Uh, and there, uh, again, we have interactions taking place between Americans and Cubans on a fairly regular basis still today, even in spite of the rhetoric that, that is coming out from the, the two capitals. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also powerful. That's another form of diplomacy, which is when you have economic interests engaged across borders. Uh, and, and the chance of that growing is, is still there. Um, and then you also see some fairly substantial legal changes that have taken place. Uh, both in Cuba and in the United States dealing with Cuba. So those, those are powerful dimensions too. We, we end the book um, after looking at these three separate dimensions by kind of stitching it together and, and making a case for how change can still occur even if Washington and Havana are not communicating regularly. Uh, the change might be slow. Uh, the change might not be immediately evident from the surface, but it is still uh, taking place. So I think that there is a, there is a powerful set of uh, causal factors that are going to slowly change that relationship. Some of it might speed up over time, um, but we can certainly expect more to come. Yeah. Uh, Rick, uh, one of the things you study is how Congress and, in and interest groups interact. And so, based on my time working in Congress, uh, I really, I was trying to think if there's an international affairs issue that, that has been, that it's so caught up in domestic interest, interest politics, and I can't think of any. Uh, and 
you know, I think we all know kind of what accounts for that. You know, South Florida is so electorally important and concentrated votes and all that sort of stuff. Um, but is that still applicable? Uh, and how, how do you expect this sort of stuff to, to affect American policy going forward? Yeah, well, there, there's a in couple interesting points that have been made so far sure. that I think fit into this. Is We're seeing some generational change, and I think that's going to be important here, right? So we have a few you know, cold warriors that are still out there that, mm -hmm. that um, as the ambassador noted, that we're driving policy for a long time. Um, when a, uh, when Obama took over, there was a, a change um, in generations almost in, in the approach here. Now, these are competing forces. It's, it's the, you know, the, the administration we have now is kind of looking back to that Cold War mentality. Um, and, and what Jonathan and Erica have been mentioning is a lot of this diplomacy that's happening at the grassroots level, I think that's starting to filter and then sort of bubble up because we've got people, I mean, everything from college students to um, folks that are going in cruise ships. There's a different perspective, right, if you've got some contact. Um, so how does that play out? Um, we can add another generational change, which is the change that's happening in South Florida, mm -hmm. right, generational replacement. One of the things that we know with new generations is they're not as tied to sort of this opposition to U.S.-Cuba relations as they used to be. Mm -hmm. So as the only driving force in politics, it, it's there, but it's not that all-consuming politics that it used to be. Right. Um, so there, there are changes that are happening, um, and they're percolating up through in the political system. And we're seeing more of that, I think, with um, in Congress, um, not as much with the administration now. But moving forward, um, it's there, right? right. And, it, and it's been sort of working its way through the system. Right. It, it's like polling. If you, if you look at the polling, I think FIU does an, an annual mm -hmm. poll of, of Cuban Americans, and, and um, it's really interesting in that, for the most part, this, this myth that they're single issue voters mm -hmm. uh, is a myth. Uh, that, that this is, they vote just as, as other people vote, you know, Republican, Democrat, for based on health care or the economy and jobs or, or, or other things. And that, that international relations and Cuba uh, issues are <coughs> third, fourth in, in terms of ranking. And, and maybe people don't know that yet. So, so maybe reiterate that to a Washington audience, <laughs> audience here. <laughs> the, you know, it's, it's tough to, to change perceptions. Yeah, and, go, and go if ahead. I can, if I can yeah. tag on to what Thanks, uh, Dr. Whitmer was saying, you know, while well, it's, you know, given as a truism yeah. that, you know, no Republican can electorally mm -hmm. do the math to be president without Florida and they can't carry Florida without the right. Cuban-American bloc, there is this generational change happening, but it's, but it's also true and probably, you know, this is a stereotype that it's, it's the older generations that vote. Yep. So, the, you know, the younger generations that are changing in their attitudes aren't there yet showing up at the ballot box, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if we take that trope to be true. Um, but the other thing is, you know, it, living in a, a constitutional system where you can only serve two terms as president, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if Trump gets reelected, and I'll pause here for collective reaction, <laughs> um, a, the, the other truth about him is that he's completely unpredictable. Right. Uh, and he's not going to need Florida again after that. Right. I mean, this is someone who does the unpredictable on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just look at North Korea. Right. So, you could see a pivot yeah. uh, in that scenario. Yeah, I, I, I wonder too if you know Obama administration could only, could they have only done that in a second term? Maybe, uh, and, Maybe. and been able to push that through. Um, so, so it's a, it's important to note that things are changing and that there's there's people people di diplomacy going on and things are things are working. But there are, uh, as you said, Jonathan, laws in place. You know the, the Helms Burton, and and there uh, there are also barriers on, on on the Cuban side as well to um, undoing this this long um, isolationism that that in bilateral ways. What what would have to do? Say a president or Congress, a uh, member of Congress wanted to start to undo this. What, what's the process for, for going through this? Maybe open, open to all, but you, since you, you wrote your chapter on, on Helms Burton well, here. What I found interesting about that entire process was that, you know, probably most folks don't realize that when 
President Clinton, you know, was willing to go ahead and support that legislation, he was really signing away presidential prerogative on foreign policy. Right. Canada that had really not been done right. historically uh, prior to that moment. And, and um, I think that, uh, again, this, who was the author, uh, was working for Jesse Helms at the time, was very prescient in, in knowing that there would probably be a, a hyper-partisanship developing as a consequence of a uh, contract with America mm. that was written in that period of time. And that when he set out the various parts of that legislation, he knew full well that the bar was set so darn high that it would be almost impossible under most scenarios for Cuba to get over it. Mm -hmm. um, they're almost draconian in their nature. Right. And then it, the ability of Cuba to reach the particular standard that's established by that law. And so what my hope is this, is that um, if the political will exists here in the United States to begin to address it, um, I don't know if it could happen in a piecemeal fashion, but perhaps it can, but that the United States has to be willing to accept whatever changes the Cubans can accomplish, because there's still a lot of things that they have to unpack on their own, and if we're going to be truly respectful of their sovereignty and the legitimacy of the regime, that has to be part of that process, and that's why I said it's really embedded in this notion of trust. Right. Well, confidence in both sides to be honest and, and forthright in, the, in their proceedings, and then to continue to give them a sense of reliability, then, or, and demonstrate that over time. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the ambassador's point was spot on, yeah. is that we can't expect, perhaps, to, for it to be immediate. But my hope is that over the course of time, and like I said, there's got to be a certain amount of political will on both sides. Yeah. That's built through an iterative process, and I think that uh, it's unfortunate that the momentum that had generated after 2014 really stopped. Yep. And, and you know, so there's going to have to be some picking out of the freezer and letting it fall a little more. Which is a, <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with that one for now. So, thank you. Andrew, can I yeah, yeah, just please. Just one of the things that, as we move forward, and and just to piggyback <laughs> on, on what Jonathan was saying is. Some of these signals have to come from Congress as well as the presidency, right? So we have to have, um, we have to have the, the, and we talk about this in the book, what are those signals and, and how do we build this trust? And it, it just can't come from the president, right? Because right. it, it's got to come from other institutions as well. And we're seeing some of that with the economic, and we're seeing it right. on the, the person to person. But... Because legislation was passed in Congress, Congress has to be a player before that next big right. step occurs. Right. And I think that's, that's maybe, and I don't want to speak for the Cubans, but I think that, that may be what they're looking for is it can't just be the president and the executive branch. It's got to be the legislative branch as well because there's only so much that the president mm -hmm. can do at this point. Yeah. So, and that's, that's that hurdle that's been built into this relationship, and, and it's a very high hurdle right now. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and I go think ahead. importantly, we live in an age now where those iterations don't have to go through the formal process of a committee espousing policy. Mm -hmm. we, we live in an age now where policy is espoused by a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, there, there are a couple of members of the House of Representatives who have figured this out, too. Uh, and, you know, are espousing their own policy yeah. changes by tweet. Uh, so. Yeah. I don't know if this means we need to abandon the, the policy creation and uh, communication process or modify it somehow, but you know, if, if the rest of the policymakers in Washington are still locked into the old cumbersome you know, system of you know, vetting policy before you espouse it, uh, uh, it's going to be too late. Yeah. You know, I, 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 please, go ahead, Eric. This kind yeah. of goes to Benjamin's point, which is about the, the building of trust which requires a iterative process, right? Since we're not seeing that yep. on a regular basis, since we are seeing wide shifts in policy from day to day and from individual to individual, from party to party, uh, I think it really makes that much more complicated, right? Because then it's hard mm -hmm. if you're espousing policy via tweet. It's really hard to know if that's really going to happen or if it's just that thought that you had for that moment. So it doesn't create that sense of reliability or confidence over time. Right. So. You, you really create this other problem where the Cubans will be watching this sort of tweet show go on and mm -hmm. just kind of figure, well, we're just going to wait and figure out what, right. what's actually going to happen. Yeah. And, and you're measuring which one's more popular exactly. by how many followers the other person has, yeah. Yeah. which, I mean, I suppose, you know, is a way for democracy to involve itself in the policy process at a grassroots level, Rick. Mm 
<laughs> but well, but the policy that they're actually voting on, you know, hasn't been vetted. Right. Yeah. The durability of it or the viability of it hasn't been tested. Isn't isn't the problem too that there's kind of this asymmetry, where for in Havana the the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba is of primary importance, and for you know the United States, it's one of many many places around the world. Um, and it's not at the front burner, and maybe it's only seen through the lens of other issues that are, like Venezuela, for instance, that are that are at, you know, closer to the front burner. Is that mm -hmm. how do you overcome well, that? Well, so I've long argued that that one of the reasons why we continue to have a hard line against Cuba is that in the ultimate end game, it doesn't cost us that much, right, in terms of foreign policy capital, and and that, I think that's unfortunate because what it does. It then subsumes any kind of initiative that might take place on the island that has meaning. And one of the things that I want us to know and understand as we kind of are here together is that there has been a vibrant internal dialogue going on in Cuba about all of this. Mm. You know, um, Radio Bemba, as they call it on the streets in Havana, <laughs> has been very vibrant in having the discussion of what a relationship that's quote unquote normal with the United States might look at and what impact that might have. On, on the day-to-day -day lives of individuals who live and, and have to experience all of this. And so I think it's important for us to keep that idea in mind because that continues unabated and with the expansion of uh, cell phone usage and, and other forms of communication on the island, it's actually having a transformative effect at the individual level. And that's where I keep my eyes on how is this impacting the individual. The fact is that everybody's got some sort of a phone now. Right. You know, it's happened in other developing countries where the primary form of communication comes in a handheld device. Right. And that really kind of subverts, you know, the kind of control that, that the government had over the people previously. Yeah. Can I just right. step in here? Because yeah, I, 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 to follow up with that, though, but maybe I can, I'm hoping there's a, a ray of sunshine with our discussion here, is that if Cuba is not at the front of foreign policy for the U.S. If it, it sort of ebbs and flows and, and um, maybe, just maybe, in larger legislation or omnibus legislation, <laughs> there's an opportunity somewhere for Congress to get involved with maybe small changes, right? If there's some will in the House and maybe by building coalitions with folks in the Senate, that that can be put in larger legislation, right? So as we get these larger pieces of legislation, if there's a small sliver that um, begins to address how the U.S., and it doesn't need to be a huge measure, it can be a small sort of incremental step. And if, if that may be the opportunity to, to move some of this forward. Now, <clears throat> I can't say I'm optimistic that that will happen, but there are opportunities, right? So larger legislation often contains smaller pieces. Right. So there are opportunities, whether they'll exist for the next year, year and a half prior to the election, I don't know. Yeah. But even afterwards, um, that's an approach because as we see Congress change, there are, no, there are fewer and fewer sort of small bills that deal with these things. Right. So larger bills, we may be able to see some of that. So. Yeah, yeah, no, and... and I mean, I haven't done the detailed vote count, but uh, having worked for uh, a Nebraska Republican senator um, who was open to engagement with Cuba, who uh, we sent a, our agriculture staff, this was 2007, I think, mm -hmm. on a delegation down with Governor uh, Heinemann. Yeah, yeah, Governor Heinemann to, to Havana, and he said it was, you know, the best part was the baseball game. But, <laughs> uh, but that, that it was a, uh, if you look at the, especially farm states, mm -hmm. there's broad Republican support for this. So, so we shouldn't think this is a purely monolithic Republican versus Democratic issue. Um, and, you know, if you start counting votes, then, then maybe you could get there. But the problem is, is like a lot of things in Congress, getting to that vote, you know, where intensity versus um, you know the, the vote counting is is a difficult hurdle to overcome well this yeah. is the policy framing right how do we do we frame this as agricultural policy or do we frame it as foreign policy right so if we've got an agricultural policy framework um, those of you 
not from the Midwest, we need all the markets we can get right now because some of our other right. markets have been sort of drying up. So how do we re... <laughs> <laughs> Despite all the rain, the markets are dried up, right? <laughs> so, um, so how do we reframe this, right? So if the issue is now about you know, agricultural policy, right? We just can't keep throwing billions of dollars at farmers in the Midwest. They don't want that. No. that they want the markets. They want to go out and they want to work, they want to produce, and they want to sell. Now, if this is an agricultural policy, right, as part of a larger agricultural bill, um, there's potential progress in that, right? So, um, I, I, you know, f there are opportunities here even with the current administration and even in this sort of freezing state of this relationship, I think that, that there's maybe not a lot of hope, but some hope that, you know, a, uh, an entrepreneurial member of Congress will step up and say, okay, let's, let's find that market. It's not as far away as, as some of these other markets, so let's, let's re-engage right, right. with that. Short so, barge yeah. across the straits. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions, I think, and, and uh, I hope you all have been thinking of good ones here. Uh, uh, please, uh, kind of a couple of ground rules. Um, please state your question in the form of a question. No long, uh, long policy <laughs> diatribes or, or anything like that. I, I will cut you off. Uh, and uh, also, please state your name and affiliation b before you start. So. I think we have a microphone, yep, so, and wait for the microphone to come around. So we're going to start with Sir right, right here in the front, and then, then we'll work our way backwards. Uh, John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Uh, two questions. One is the political context now. Uh, there are 47 co-sponsors to the bill to end travel restrictions that lay submitted. That includes every Democratic candidate for president who's a senator. Even Booker has now joined the list, and he was the last mm -hmm. to do it. The House will clearly go for ending travel restrictions. If those majorities exist, is that potentially this year a major defrost? On For Dr. Benjamin Alvarado, if the, if Title III is abolished, that is, if Helms-Burton is repealed, and I note that Democratic candidates for the first time are talking about mm -hmm. ending the embargo, virtually all of the serious candidates mm -hmm. are on record for calling for an end to the embargo. So what is the implication of doing away with Title III for the current suits that are happening, and does that motivate cruise companies and various others whose ox is being gored to want to see a legislative change. So you know, optimistic about unfreezing and, and what happens? Well, there. you know, I mean, I still think, and I think the work that Mike and his colleagues did on, on really kind of laying out the parameters of, of what it would take to actually address that particular issue as it relates to property claims, because really that's the core of what Title III is about, you know. And, the, and it, that it allows uh, aggrieved parties in this country to, whether or not they're um, certified claimants or non-certified claimants, to be able to, you know, advance a uh, uh, suit against the Cuban government. I still think that has to be that has to be addressed. That has to be part of that reconciliation. I think the Cubans are willing to have that conversation. I, I think if you give them the opportunity to do it. But let's just not make the bar so darn high that it, we, they can't accomplish any progress whatsoever. And I really think that's where we've been for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think there's anybody in Cuba that would argue to you. And, and many other countries have already settled their claims with Cuba. So there's, there's, there's already plenty of examples out there of how we can go about doing this. And that's why I go back to this notion of whether or not we have the actual political will to do it. And, um, you know, like I said, um, and for many people who have had claims in the past, um, I know there was a whole concerted effort on the part of some folks in this country to go up and try to buy them all up with the hope that they were going to enrich themselves. And people would ask me, especially in the energy field, well, what should I do? I've got this claim for you know offshore oil on the southern coast. I said, well, 
well, there's no oil there, sell it, take the money today. You know? So, <laughs> you know, so I think that there's plenty of precedent for it. But like I said, it gets, it gets muddied, and this is why I'll, I'll defer to my friends in the legal field yeah. here to kind of help sort through it a little bit more, because it really is a very legal question. Yeah, well, Mike, I, Mike, what's it look yeah. like? I mean, it, does, it, does the Bacardi family just go back and take well, the building? Well, yeah, that, <laughs> each claim is different. <laughs> okay. You right. know, and, and out of the hundreds and hundreds of claims that Rick and Erica surveyed here you know, with students in D.C., yeah. um, each one has a different character, and each one has a different animating force. You know, some of them are, are very... You know, emotional based, and and Ambassador De Laurentiis, you know, uh, alluded to this. You know, it was my grandfather's sugar mill. You know, and I'm never going to give up on that. Mm -hmm. Some of them are more corporate, and the thing about uh, you know expropriated property claims is they never go away. Uh, they're protected under international law, so they keep coming back like Frankenstein's monster. Uh, you can't kill them, and they get <laughs> traded, especially the corporate ones, mm -hmm. through mergers and acquisitions. Um, you know, so the, the, uh, the, the, the second biggest claim uh, on the books, uh, which was the old uh, ITT claim, the International Telephone yeah. and Telegraph, you know, is now owned through a series of mergers and acquisitions uh, by Marriott. Uh, it was Starwood Resorts, but they got huh. bought by Marriott. And the claims go with them. Marriott's not interested in rusting old telephone towers. <laughs> What's, <laughs> what is Marriott interested in? Beachfront real estate. Right. Right? So, you know, and, and all, of, all of these are connected to everything else that's happening on the island. We have a great chapter in our book uh, by Professor Vercek uh, from Loyola University in New Orleans that talks about, you know, some of the environmental policy choices that Cuba's going to have to make. Because Cuba has been uh, a, a, an island in a state of arrested economic development right. since 1959. That has resulted in a pristine island where rainforests are still intact, where they still have coral reefs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they could make the economic decision to allow agribusiness to come in and strip mine all those out and put in sugarcane. They could allow Carnival to come in and, right. and destroy the coral reefs with their big ships. Or Cuba could decide, we're going to be the island that has the first fully green economy in the world. Yep. They could make that choice. And they could make that deal with Marriott. Look, you do, a, a in, in conjunction with us, a joint venture on that beachfront property. We're going to trade you for your property claim on that old rusting telegraph tower, a uh, fully green resort, right, Yeah. Uh, up on the North Shore. And you're going to be the leader for what's going to come next. Right. And then property claim by property claim, even when Coca-Cola comes mm -hmm. in, right? Uh, they make it part of that, that vision for what they want their economy to look at. But they've got to have the political will and courage to have that conversation internally, which is you know, part of what they're doing now, and then put that on the table with the American administration and the American companies. They're going to settle out these claims in hopefully creative ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go to ma'am in the back there. Uh, right, right there. Yep. Make sure. It's amateur. Hello, my name is Chloe and I'm with the London School of Economics. Um, I want to talk about geopolitics a little bit and the impact of international relations in this context. So I would like to know um, from whoever wants to address it, um, how you think the Trump administration's approach to Venezuela is going to impact perspectives or possibilities for any sort of cooling with the Cuban regime, especially given its deep connections to Maduro and his people. All right, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, in large part because I have a, a very vested academic interest in Venezuela to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we've already seen this sort of play itself out right now with the Trump administration. Um, because there doesn't appear to be a single coherent strategy uh, to their foreign policy, it really is just sort of uh, very uh, ad hoc. Um, one of the things that we have seen, that's a nice way to put it, uh, one of the things that we have seen is uh, this interest with Venezuela and Maduro. Uh, and to use that particular uh, humanitarian and political situation uh, to deal with the Cubans. So we see that translation, the concern about human rights and the current Maduro regime um, as a way to get at the Cuban regime as well. Uh, there are close ties between the two regimes um, for a lot of really obvious reasons. Obviously, uh, Cuba has been on the outs. Um, and so has Venezuela. Uh, 
But they've also shared a great deal. Even before Maduro came to power, uh, when Hugo Chavez was president, he really made a big effort to reach out to Cuba. Uh, again, for ideological reasons, for personal reasons. So there are a lot of ties between those two countries. Right now, the concern about regime change in Venezuela is also uh, playing itself out uh, with our relationship with the Cubans. So it's also part of that, that freezer, uh, the, the rationale that if we put pressure on Cuba, it will somehow benefit um, what we hope to achieve in Venezuela, which is some form of regime change. So the two are connected in that way and also spoiling the possibility of any conversation between the Trump administration and uh, these two regimes, um, it, it doesn't help any uh, that the Maduro regime is also on the outs with much of the Americas. The OAS has not been on board with what's been going on in Venezuela, um, but the OAS I probably would deal with the situation differently instead of linking Cuba and Venezuela. Yeah, the impact right now is primarily economic because of the fact that Cuba had relied so extensively on a preferential trade arrangement for, for oil. And now that that has kind of run by the, on the, on, under the rocks yet again, I mean, I think we've gone back to the future. This is what happened to Cuba with its relationship with preferential trade with, with Russia, is that it's really placed their economy, in, you know, in a very, very tight vice. Um, they have few degrees of freedom whatsoever as it relates to energy, energy development, energy supply on the island. And this is why we're seeing this return of uh, you know, interrupted energy supply, of blackouts on the island in, in, in certain locations. You add to that the reality of a very aged and almost obsolete infrastructure for the delivery of that, that really compromises so much of what Cuba had been able to accomplish because of that relationship with Venezuela in the past. And so, you know, where are they getting their oil from now? And that's a, a great question because of uh, so many other restrictions that are placed on the Cubans. And this is one of the areas where the embargo does work. The embargo works through trade denial, through, <coughs> through technology transfer denial to Cuba. I mean, they did try a few years back to, to explore offshore uh, exploration. The cost of doing that was so prohibitively high that even if they would have found anything, it would have been all but impossible for them to receive the kind of credit internationally that it would take to develop that. You know, and the reality of it is, if you talk to the oil experts out there, they would say the only way that comes to fruition is with the deep cooperation with the United States right. and United States companies. Right. I mean, you just think, all, all the rigs could come straight over from Houston or, or Louisiana, or they're shipped from China or you know, someplace like that, and, and just the costs of, of that sort of stuff it becomes prohibitive. Yeah. Can I just, there's, a, there's another, uh, and we, we have a, a chapter in the book that talks about the relationship between China and Cuba and how that's helping that's to shape this. That's an important thing to pull. Um, and, and I think that's going to be important moving forward. And we're starting to hear a little bit about Russia right now trying to re-engage with Cuba. Um, there's just some, some chatter about that. So, I mean, Venezuela is important, um, but I think we've got to look at, at how China engages, how Russia engages, and some of these other actors as well. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of, of other potential players that are either coming back or, or trying to exert or re-exert some of that influence and, and um, move back into Cuba. And that's, I don't know, it, it's, we're so close and then we're seeing these folks from so far away. Um, sort of gives us a bit of pause. Yeah, when, when we came, uh, our delegation came back from Havana uh, two years ago, a couple of our uh, retired generals who, who went on the trip wrote an op-ed that was placed in Politico. I think there's some copies in the back there. But basically saying that, look, if we don't engage uh, with Cuba, you know, you leave an open playing field for our rivals to come in, China, Russia. We've seen, we've seen the Russian spy ship parking in Havana. We've Certainly, a lot of the investment is coming from from China. Even mm -hmm. if it's hotel investment, it's still um, you know it's money coming in that supports it. Um, questions? Let's do. Uh, may I, I'm going to do a couple here. So you, and then the sir behind you. So wait for the. So we'll we'll take two questions and then we'll we'll try and uh, answer them in turn. Okay. Hi. My name is Chantel, and I'm a. Uh, 
recent graduate student from Georgia State's University's uh, School of Policy Studies. My question uh, has to do, we have fugitives that have sought asylum in Cuba, one of the most famous ones being uh, Joanne Chesimard, Sada Shakur, and recently President Trump and other lawmakers have called for her extradition. There was a governor in, in New Jersey, I believe it was in 1998, and she made the statement saying that these, fugitive, these fugitives, particularly Sada Shakur, was the primary reason that a healthy relationship could not be restored between the United States and Cuba. Please weigh in on that topic. Okay, we will, and, and I'm going to ask for the sir behind you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take both of these. Hi, my name is Bruce <coughs> Zagaros. I'm an attorney with Berliner Cork Monroe. So my question has to do with security, since this is the American Security mm -hmm. Project. Towards the end of the Obama administration, the two countries signed an MOU on enforcement concerning about eight different areas, everything from narcotics, terrorism, migration and trafficking in persons, mm -hmm. maritime, environment. And the groups met two or three times, but in July of last year, the U.S. decided not to meet right. anymore. So in terms of the costs, it seems like, and I'd like your response, but one of the costs has to do with foreign policy and national security. Yeah. And I'm also wondering if your book deals with any of those issues. And it obviously ties into the question before. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Two, two closely related questions, and security and, and extradition. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll it, 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 as I said before, everything's related. Right. So we take glancing <laughs> blows at these also uh, in, in the context of other things that we're talking about. You know, just circling back to, uh, you know, offshore drilling, you know, the nightmare scenario for the U.S. is the Chinese National Petroleum Corporation drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, is, that a secure, is that a national security issue? Yes. Is that an economic security issue? Yes. It's, it's, all, it's not one. It's all, it's all of the above, and, and they, they tend to be wrapped up together uh, in other things. As far as criminal enforcement goes and, and extradition, I mean, this, this has been a dicey game, you know, between the U.S. and Cuba for decades. Um, you know, our, our person's uh, freedom, our, our view of someone as a freedom advocate is, you know, a political dissident in Cuba. And, and until you get agreement and an extradition treaty in force yep. that, that has dual criminality, you're not going to get any kind of predictability on fugitives being transferred back and forth, especially if the jurisdiction happens to be Florida, uh, because you can't really extrogate mm -hmm. politics uh, from the underlying alleged mm -hmm. crimes. And, and I, I don't think I'm overstating that. Mm -hmm. I? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, I think it's rather unfortunate that we've terminated that, ch that channel uh, to, to have dialogue with the Cubans. In my experience, going back to the mid-1990s, there's always been very vibrant discussion yeah. about many of these issues, especially with congressional delegations, retired military mm -hmm. uh, and diplomatic officers that would go to Cuba on various trips, that they would have that opportunity to engage. And they would come back and, and share that information. It wasn't like this was state secrets. As a matter of fact, I think that, you know, we had a very positive and very robust relationship around many of these areas. Uh, drug interdiction is one of them that, that was really kind of profiled uh, some years back. And so I find it very unfortunate that we're not having that. I think it's something in terms of our regional security that should be central to, to the way we, we could move forward with Cuba. And the fact that we don't have that now available to us, you know, it just removes a, an additional tool that we might have to assuage some of the concerns that have been, that, that have been you know, stated here. But also it really minimizes our ability to engage with Cuba in a very important area because it has been successful. We do have proof of concept there. You know, and I think that it really undermines any kind of value proposition we would put forth in the future if we don't have that available to us. And like I said, so yeah, we it, it almost becomes like a, a black hole area that you don't, as, as a security professional, you don't actually know what, what's going on in there. Communication is incredibly important. Uh, I'll take two more, uh, sir, down front here, and then we'll do behind you. So thank you. Yes. My name is Haro Cárdenas. I'm founder of Joven Cuba, an independent media in Cuba. 
And thanks to the normalization, the brief normalization we had, I just finished a master's degree in international affairs at Columbia University. I want to add just something that hasn't been mentioned a lot today, and is uh, the correlation of forces in Cuba. Because I think that one of the collateral damages of the Trump policy has been that it created a perception in Cuba that hardliners are necessary. And if you're not a hardliner, if, you, if you're a non-radical, either in the, from the position or from the government, then you're not necessary. And, and I think that's an issue. In, in my experience, I applied to come to the US the day after the 2016 election. I knew what was going to happen. And, I, and I've seen what has happened in Cuba. Independent medias are closing. And that's what's happening there right now. Yeah. So my question to the panel is, if you're considering that political diversity and how future, uh, and how future normalization um, could address that, you know, how could it affect the correlation of forces and who's profiting in the political forces of Cuba from a, normal, a normalization? Yeah, yeah this normalization <laughs> help or hurt in that. Mm -hmm. We'll go to Sir behind you, and then, then we'll take both of those together. Yeah. Yeah, Ken Meyer Accord. Um, in the early days of the revolutionary regime uh, regarding compensation, as I understand it, the Cubans uh, pro uh, offered to compensate American mm -hmm. owners of property according to what they had been uh, listing their assets as worth to the Cuban tax authorities. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was not acceptable to the uh, Americans. Uh, has, is that true is that good in that regard? And also, in terms of compensation, are the Cubans uh, uh, demanding compensation for the losses they've suffered from the embargo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, to answer that last question first, yes. Uh, over $100 billion in claims, you know, economic damages from the embargo um, are, are what Cuba's alleging. And, and the thing about compensation is there's lots of different forms this can take. Um, you know, in our, in our uh, proposal uh, from 2007 that we did for the State Department, um, you know, we, we created a, a draft bilateral compensation tribunal along the lines of the U.S. Iran claims tribunal mm -hmm. uh, to settle out claims like that. But uh, very often, claims are settled in lump sum form. Uh, a lump sum is paid to the government that represents the claimants and then divvied out, you know, internally and domestically. Um, this, of course, would be a much larger lump sum than, than other, uh, other claims, uh, which is why you know, we, we actually advocated in our prior book when it looked like things were moving towards a more normalized process that uh, you know, the United States could back a lump sum settlement through a loan from the Inter-American Development Bank or the World Bank or the IMF that we would sponsor Cuba joining and, and be wrapped up in this whole bilateral normalization process and be done with the property claim issue. Um, of course, there wasn't political will, we know, for that to happen. Um, but but the, you know, the thorniness of the, the issues come from sometimes the emotions involved in it. Yeah. You know, in my contribution to the book, I wrote specifically that for Cuba's hardliners, this has been a godsend, the reversal of the, uh, the Obama um, advances and it, you know and and people need to understand that there were very intense ideological battles going on inside of Cuba after 2014 a very vigorous discussion and actually a lot of forums that were people were brought in and, and there was uh, I'm just gonna say it was it was uh, exciting to be in the room if you had that opportunity um, but it's given the hardliners once again the I told you so hand as it relates to how this is playing out and I think the thing that, you know, um, from the perspective of the hardliners, in particular in Cuba, to your point specifically, that Americans have proven yet again to be unreliable and unpredictable and are only interested in Cuba's collapse, you know. And so that's my sense of it. And, and there's others in, in the policy field that have kind of echoed very similar sentiments. And I, I think to add to Jonathan's point, um, that this is something we have seen before. Right? We have seen these sorts of opportunities sort of snatched um, and then create uh, perfect excuses for hardliners. That's true in Cuba, but it's also true geopolitically mm -hmm. all across the world. Mm -hmm. So when, when the U.S. takes a hard line, it really does provide a good justification for clamping down and, and closing off uh, potentially diverse political conversations in other and, parts And that's of the world. even caused a... Uh, um, um, more vigorous response by Cubans on the ground 
They think, wait a second, we have all this momentum, all these wonderful things are happening, and, and they're going to allow the hardliners to, to, to claim the day yet again. Could, uh, could uh, it have gone, it, you, you talk about there was a, a kind of a rigorous debate within Cuba. Um, did they miss an opportunity there? Because there was two and a half years uh, of, during the Obama administration mm -hmm. where they could have gone further faster and gotten more stuff done. And certainly, if you look at the, the raft of agreements signed during the lame duck period, it seemed like they, they realized that they, they maybe were missing an opportunity. Um, and that goes to the domestic politics yeah. inside Cuba. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of people uh, subscribe to the conventional wisdom that, you know, just like only Nixon could go to China, mm -hmm. only a Castro could open the United States right. uh, for domestic purposes. And so that's why Raul was, was needed to do that. Uh, but he didn't have either the foresight or the savvy to push it as far as he could have. But, mm -hmm. but again, you know, I, I, I would defer to uh, Dr. Ben Benjamin Alvarado on that since he's more in tune with the domestic politics side in Cuba. You know, I was troubled that, that um, well, you know, there's a, there were a lot of things at play that were going on at the latter part of, uh, of uh, Mr. Castro's presidency, obviously. Um, understanding that, that we knew that there was going to be a change. Uh, you know, uh, with the death of Fidel, uh, there was a very palpable um, sense of loss on, on the part of the Cuban people. So they're trying to make sense of that as well. I mean, I, I didn't have any sense of it until we were actually in Havana right in about a month after Fidel passed. And, and, we, and then almost, I talked to everybody that I could what kind of impact that was having. And it was much more pronounced than I thought it was going to be. It was very deeply felt by the people because I think at the end of the day they were more Castroistas than anything else, you know, on the island. And, and so um, I think that we had to, I, I felt that like we needed to grant them a little bit of space to process that. Mm. Yeah. I think this has been part of the Cuban identity for such a very long time for us to, you know, summarily expect them to just to say, okay, now we're going to move on to the next thing. I don't right. think that's the way people think it right. or work in that particular setting. And obviously, there were lots of different things at play. And you know, and so I wish that we wouldn't have had just this sudden disruption again of what was occurring on the island. But we have, and now we're having to live with it. Yeah. Well, there's just one more thing about this is, let's look at it from, from the US and what Cuba was looking to the US at that same time. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they were reading the same polls, and they had the same feeling about you know, what was going to happen in the US. and, and I mean, I don't know what they were thinking, but if, if we look, I suspect they were not, you know, expecting Trump to be elected, right? right. Little, like a lot of people were. Right. So if they would have known that, you know, that was, you know, a high probability event, you might have seen a very different relationship and, and movement in ways that, that we didn't. So, um, you know, what were, what were they seeing here? Probably the same thing that, that many of us were seeing. So there would be this continuation of the policy, and all of a sudden, oh my God, now what do we do, right? Yeah. So it, it yeah. created a couple of things that were yeah. sort of simultaneously. A lot of scrambling. Yeah. Uh, we'll go to Sir here. The, the two of you right there. Wait for the microphone. These two right here. Uh, and then, then I think we'll we'll close up after that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Frank Fletcher, Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Um, the uh, causes and the effects on U.S.-Cuban relations of the sonic attacks. And would you make an analogy um, to what was going on in the Clinton administration? It was so close to a breakthrough, and then Brothers to the Rescue happened. And that's, of course, the precursor to the Helms-Burton legislation. But in other words, getting close to something that's really a breakthrough, and then there's sabotage of some kind by someone. Yeah, I think that's an important one to bring up. Sir, here. Right next, you pass it right, right down there. Yep. Uh, Emmanuel Pastreich, the Asia Institute. So if uh, Cuba has gone back into the freezer as it was, it's at simultaneously the uh, Trump administration has decided to take another country out of the freezer, North Korea. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of parallels, both in terms of infrastructure and, of course, mm -hmm. all sorts of secret negotiations probably going on right now. 
you have any suggestions or hints as to uh, how North Korea might learn from your experiences or how the U.S. might learn? Well, we're, uh, he's dealing with that freezer burn on his fingers right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I appreciate the analogy. Uh, and, and it's true. Um, you know, these, uh, but, but the thing that's unique about Cuba uh, that is not so true about, you know, the other countries that we have difficult relationships with, whether it's North Korea or Iran uh, or whoever, is that our, our relationship with Cuba has, has been closer, longer, right. and, and, and the history is much deeper. Um, and so there, there's, there's potential to build on, even though it keeps, uh, as Frank said, keep, keeps getting sabotaged uh, you know, over and over again, which goes back to Bruce's point about security. Right. Um, you know, at, at, at what point uh, do these, do, does the political will inside both countries mature to reach a, a tipping point to get the relationship going. I mean, you look at the cover of our book, and there's a uh, 58 Thunderbird driving in front of the American Embassy in Havana. Yeah. Thank you, Rick, for that picture. Okay. <laughs> and you know, there's a range of emotions when you look at that picture. There's nostalgia, there's regret, and there's hope. Uh, and I think that's the way we look at the Cuba relationship. And, and the whole point of our book is to land on the the note of hope at the end, um, as, as you know, quixotic as that might be. But, but with respect to the, you know, the sonic attacks, yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, in fact, I'd like to get Ambassador De Laurentiis' opinion on this, since it <laughs> happened, you know, uh, directed towards our embassy. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was shocking and shocking. astounding and, you know, something that, you know, uh, really, I think, you know, put everybody back on their heels. I'm going to respond a little bit to the, uh, the incidents in 1996 leading up to um, Helms Burton. I was in Havana um, having dinner, actually, with the interest uh, section, some folks in the interest section, uh, the second time that the leaflets fell over the, in downtown Havana. And my dinner immediately ended. Um, I, I, I came back to the United States and about a month and a half later I went back with uh, um, Admiral Eugene Carroll and, a, and another delegation um, and we were told in a meeting with members of the Cuba's Ministry of Defense um, very pointedly that we should deliver a message back to uh, the US government that if they didn't stop the flyovers that the Cubans would stop it themselves. Now. Um, and then when Admiral Carroll got back, he held a press conference. And, and lo and behold, about a month and a half later, um, the Cubans blast the civilians out of the sky. Um, it was a blatant violation of international law, because they were in international waters. They, were, they, had, they had flown over, um, but they were no longer in Cuban airspace. And you know, I think it was a rather unfortunate affair. I think the, behind that, though, is Clinton knew full well that he could not also win the presidency a second term unless he won Florida. I mean, and nobody really wants to test that proposition in presidential um, politics. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tough proposition mm -hmm. to, to really kind of pursue. And so my thought was that while certainly it helped to move the legislation, I didn't think at the time that it was as germane to the point that Clinton actually needed to sign Helms Burton, irrespective of what happened with Brothers to the Rescue. I think that it just helped, it made it easier for him to do it. So that's just my opinion on it, you know, but I guess it was kind of there during that whole period of time. And it was also doing some work here in Washington at that time. And so, um, but like I said, it was, it was like, it, sometimes it reminded me of the old Ed Sullivan show where the guy's spitting the plates and trying to keep them all up. And I think that's what was going on. We were trying to figure out how we were going to continue to move forward, but Clinton was also trying to figure out how he was going to get a second term, and it was it was it was in question at that time. Yeah, and I think it was a gift. Yeah, I, I think there's a there's an interesting point here to be highlighted, um, as Professor Kelly pointed out, the relationship between Cuba and the U.S. has been very close. Very, it's got a very long history. In many ways, it's very intimate. Right. We are merely 90 miles away. We've got a very long history. We've got people in common. Uh, and there's a certain level of emotion that tends to bubble up because of this relationship. On the one hand, that gives us hope that there is a possibility for communication, for normalization, for regular relations to return between these two neighbors. 
On the other hand, as you might all know, with any sort of intimate relationship, it means even little things wind up blowing up and being bigger than they, they might seem on the surface. Um, I think also kind of following on um, what Dr. Benjamin Alvarado said, uh, there, there is a certain, um, not necessarily causal element to the sonic attacks, like did the sonic attacks really cause the Trump administration to, to clamp down? No, I think they had really planned to do that. Uh, they signaled that very early on. But it made it easier to do so, mm -hmm. much like the uh, Brothers to the Rescue uh, event could have also played the same role during the Clinton administration. So I mean, I think these are, these are events, they can help facilitate that. But there, that suggests that something underneath those particular events still lies, mm -hmm. that you can tap into that. Yep. And I think we've seen that repeatedly. Mm -hmm. yep. Hope versus roadblocks. I think that's a good place to end on. <laughs> we'll be here to, uh, to discuss if you want to follow up afterwards. We'll have this all up on the website uh, within a day or two. Thank you for, for coming. Thanks for your interest. Um, follow us on Twitter, AMSEC Project, Facebook, all that sort of stuff. Thanks for, thanks for your time and thanks for your interest. And join me in. Thank you.